Beautiful morning to you. It's the first Wednesday in the month of March, and it's the year 2021. This is Everyday Money Matters, and it is your number one uh, personal finance show brought to you in partnership with uh, Naira Metrics. And today is a wonderful, wonderful day for us to have money discussions, talking about personal finance and everything that will help you make sense of it all. And of course, as always, I have uh, our dear friends from Naira Metric here, and uh, I think I have uh, quite a full house today, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I think I do. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce you to the men and women of the money team. And of course, as always, it's a very highly interactive program. You can join the conversation just uh, by sending in your questions to us. WhatsApp is 0809-234-5913, 0809-234-5913. And uh, you can also join us on Twitter, at Lagos Talks 913, at Lagos Talks 913, you can use that to join us and uh, let's get talking there. And remember, Naira Metrics is your foremost platform for personal finance and uh, information in the area of uh, money and the market. So do make sure you go check it out, nairometrics.com. Well, let me introduce you to the men and women of the money team. Today, I have Olumide Adishina joining us. Hello, Olumide, good morning. Uh, good morning, Adu. Looking How good. How you today? Yeah, fine, fine. You know, the picture, the picture in your background is telling me that the sky is looking blue today. <laughs> yeah, the sky is obviously, obviously blue. The market has been running in the past, uh, after some market correction in the past yeah. days. So it looks good, yeah, this morning. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Also, I have here Loretta Egba. Loretta, good morning. How are you doing? Won't you cancelled? Can you hear me? Hi, good morning. Uh, um, morning. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you very well. I can hear you very well. Good to yeah, have you on. Good morning. All right, good to have you on. All right, thank you. Now, um, so just to remind you, your questions, please send them to the WhatsApp line 0809 234 5913. Now, we have a couple of questions here already pre sent in. And a few of them are spillover from last week, but we'll just dial, uh, dial straight into them and answer the question. So let me start from the very first that is here before me. Now this question goes to, um, I would say, uh, Olumide, please explain what interest income means in the banking sector. And the second rider, how does it work? Yeah, uh, I think that's more of a direct question, but I'll um, just scratch on it. Uh, interest income basically a kind of earnings you earn from uh, um, interest and uh, using assets like uh, securities and deposits, and basically is used uh, mostly by banks and engaging banks and um, any metrics. So you want to know how banks um, use the, um, depositors funds um, in a fiscal year, and like I said. Uh, Interest income is very important in knowing how profitable a bank is because one of the objectives of banks are earning um, returns on the um, shareholders' investment. So, uh, basically, like that. Then, uh, you know, uh, there are two kinds of um, income as far as the bank is concerned. There's the non interest income, that's the one that uh, are again uh, earned from investment that come from transactions and uh, ATM charges and stuff like that. So, um, investors usually look at the interest. Um, Stock traders particularly look at the interest uh, rate income, particularly to know how healthy the bank is uh, driving its traditional metrics. So I'll allow Laura that to go. Okay, Laura, so please uh, add to that. Okay, um, interest income is so when you take a loan, normally um, you pay interest on it. For a regular company, that um, interest you are paying is an expense, so it's a cost item to you. But for a bank, on the other hand, knowing that banks are the ones that give you loans, um, the interest that um, the people taking the loans pay is an income to them. That's why it's a little different when it comes to bank to the banks. So interest income is simply whatever interest um, you pay when you get a loan to a bank. So it is a source of revenue for the bank. So that's clear. Okay, thank you very much, Loretta and Olumide. Uh, so the next question would then be, what are the procedures needed to purchase shares or stock from a company? Okay, uh, 
purchasing stocks, there are so many options. Um, depends on if the person wants to buy a public uh, listed company or a private listed company. If it's a public listed company, the normal traditional means you can go through the stock market, having a, opening a stock uh, trading account in any of the top investment bank, or you can go through um, hedge funds, um, go through um, other investment outfits that uh, sell some kind of uh, investment assets that come in stock ownership. Then if he wants to go through the secondary market, that means the stock is not, the company is not listed on the stock market or stuff like that. Mm. He can do that through the secondary listing. That will have to go through the private equity firms or venture capital. So basically, it all depends on the kind of um, company is trying to invest in, the funds he has, and um, the location of uh, such uh, company as well. Okay. Um, so let's talk about funds now. A couple of questions here, uh, two of them actually, that are asking specifically about funds and investment. So there are two, so I'll maybe Loretta will answer one and uh, Olumide, you answer the other. The first person is asking, what investment can I make with a monthly net worth or net income of 68,000 Naira? I barely have enough to save, that's question one. Then question two, which is similar, is I would like you to advise me on invest, investment options with capital with a capital of 1.5 million Naira. So um, who would go first? Okay. Yeah, maybe I should start from you know, the harder one. If you have a monthly net income of 68,000 Naira, yes. um, I don't know what standard of living is, but um, typically, you would say that you know that's not very that's not that's not enough in the first place. But what I can say is, um, when it comes to investing, the idea is that you need to to sacrifice a little bit now um, to enjoy some future gains. However, it does not also mean that when you have you, are, you can't really see, you are struggling to survive or you don't have enough income to meet your needs, then you should still carry half of. Um, your income and save. So what I'll say is first, have a little bit of earnings, you know, even if it's just 10,000 Naira out of, you know, what you have every month, um, have a little bit of savings and the savings is not necessarily for you to be rich in the future. It's just for you to meet um, short term um, emergencies that crop up that you can, you know, we get stuff out of. But I would say you should also invest in your capacity to earn because, you know, saving out of nothing is still nothing. You know, investing out of something small is, is still nothing. So I was thinking I'm um, investing your capacity to earn. So if you can first, you know, find new opportunities that um, would help you make more money. So look into, I don't know what you do now, but look into freelancing because now um, it doesn't matter where you are from, whatever part of the world you can earn money. I'm looking to freelance and see if there's something, see if there's a skill you can learn, um, something you can learn, you know, um, that's what investing your capacity to earn is. So if there's a skill you know you need to probably take a short course on that will be able to give you more money from the next month, that would help. But the idea is first, as, more, as long as you can put out something aside for your emergency fund, you should be able to, um, the next thing is, you know, increase how much money, increase your streams of income first, and we can talk about investing. And you, you know, Loretta, this is, is actually a, a reality for a lot of people because uh, the minimum wage currently is about 30,000 Naira. So assuming um, that a large chunk of the people on the pyramid level live in that space, uh, many might be asking this question because this person might just be speaking the mind of a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, okay. Yeah. Let me add up what the writer said. Um, I think um, the same narrative is that um, those, those uh, that fund, whether 1.5 or um, 68,000 are in, in, in international market standard, that's pretty very low. And um, I think uh, a lot of people need to understand that investment is not just involving monetary um, gains. Uh, you must create value. And how do you create value? You must invest intellectually in yourself. Somebody that is earning 68,000, for example, has no capacity. Um, level in terms of the economy, there are really anything you can purchase. You know, retail statistics has revealed that um, most Nigerians spend 50% on food budgets, you know, and um, 
capacity of their earnings on full budget. And that tells you that um, when you have inflation hovering at over 16%, then you're in serious trouble. So I basically tell people that um, based on your intellectual skills, try and develop yourself. If you are not really educated, find other options. You know, most of us on, on, on the channel, we have four or five streams of income that brings us uh, funds, you know. And the reason is because one, as you can't just depend on one stream of income for survival, especially when you're coming in the frontier market like Nigeria. Like inflation. So I'll tell you follow, uh, what Loretta said, like um, investing in yourself and how do you invest in yourself, mm -hmm. acquire a lot of intellectual skills. If you think you can't afford um, going to the normal traditional business schools and things like that, there are a lot of uh, courses online, Coursera, Udemy. Uh, there are so many programs you, uh, you can do. I do a lot of uh, these programs and, and traditional business school program schools. Then you also, if you are not really that educated, you can learn skills, you know, the legal state government, for example, has set up a lot of um, entrepreneurship programs, private equity firms do have a kind of um, supported private uh, programs that you can learn skills, tailoring, fashion designing, all these things require this little or no fund. So I, I think in the economy is just trying to tell us that we need to increase our purchasing power because that is the next um, um, where it's going to happen. As COVID-19 is coming down, inflation is not just going to come down immediately. So people need to be aware that they need to up their game. And there's this to what the federal government can do. So I think they need to increase their purchasing power by investing intellectually and entrepreneurial building. Thank you. All right, thank you, Illumine and uh, Loretta for that comment there. Uh, just in case you're just joining us, this is Lagos Talks 91.3 FM. My name is Adu, and I'm joined here by the bright minds of Naira Metrics, uh, the money team precisely, Olumide and Loretta. And you're on to Everyday Money Matches, brought to you in partnership with Naira Metrics. And uh, just to give you a bit of uh, interest, uh, shall I say interesting thought or interesting comment, this show is going to be available on YouTube momentarily after we are done. So head, head over to Naira Metrics on YouTube and you get to watch the video of the show. Perhaps you didn't join us on time. Uh, you can rewatch it there and get to see, you know, and learn again over and over and over again. And perhaps you are into uh, stock and you want to know more about the stock market. You want to uh, get more abreast of what's going on in the markets. Uh, well, Ugo Dre, who is uh, also part of the Naira Metrics team, is uh, very experienced in this area. And he has something called uh, the Naira Metrics Stock, uh, Stock Select Newsletter. So Ugo Dre uh, goes and shows you some stock and well, you know what's going on, what's good, what's not, and stuff like that. So you can subscribe to that newsletter and you can get information on the stock market and how it affects you. All you need to do is follow this link, ssn.nairometrics.com. I'll say that again, it's ssn.nairometrics.com. So head over there and you can subscribe to the newsletter and you don't have to struggle or crack your brain as to which stock is good to buy or not. Just subscribe and you'll be fine. All right, let's get back into the questions. Uh, let me see, a lot of them are similarly hovering around the area, same area, but let me just go into this particular one here. It says, uh, can Money Team, can you explain to me what are open-end mutual funds? Okay, uh, okay, Larissa, go ahead. You want to talk about yeah. Well, just, a, just an overview. Um, as the name implies, open-end mutual funds are um, investments that are open-ended. So you can buy, you can, invest or withdraw your investments at any point in time, pretty much. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I, I think um, going deep. Uh, Sorry. When you from the word open, yeah, okay. open funds. Yeah, from the open funds. Buy or withdraw? Because uh, I wasn't quite sure what she said. Okay, yeah. Uh, like uh, open funds, for example, mutual funds basically are kind of um, uh, funds that you can at any time um, buy from the fund manager. You know, usually the fund manager is the one that controls um, this kind of fund. So it has no closing um, date for, for purchasing. But closed uh, open fund basically are the ones that once the fund starts in operation, you can't buy uh, additional assets. So the difference is just um, the pricing and liquidity uh, at the time at which you can um, have access to this asset. But they are both um, controlled by the fund manager they, they both depend on the skills, and uh, uh, but um, the closed funds are traded on the stock market. You see a lot of them, and um, or, or some OTC counters. So basically, it's just how 
uh, one is um, the redemption time and the other one has a very close and specific redemption time. Thank you. Okay, so speaking of bonds and investment and the likes, there's another question here. Uh, this person is asking, what are zero coupon <laughs> bonds and how are the investments done? Zero coupon bonds and how are the investment done? Okay, yeah, zero so, coupon bonds are kind of um, bonds that don't give any coupon. And from the word zero coupons, they don't give any coupon. So how do investors really make money? Um, uh, these kind of bonds are usually sold at a discount and um, they have short-term tenor usually. Um, a common type of zero coupon bonds are the treasury bills. Uh, they have no coupons, but uh, they are sold at a discount. So for example, if a TB is selling for, supposed to be selling uh, for 10,000 is offered to you at 8,500, you have a discount of 1,005. Simple, that's what it really means. Awesome. Loretta, you want to add to that? No, I mean, that's, that summarizes everything. Zero coupon bonds, you don't, they're not like your typical bonds where you say you get 5% interest or 10% interest. You buy it at a discount. So when you want to redeem it, you redeem it at um, full face, at the face value. So if the face value is 10,000 there, it has been sold to you at, like you said, 8,500. And so you make gains um, um, when, you sold, when you paid in full on face value, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's move on now into some other questions. Mm. Now, this one's uh, a little bit, uh, you know, interesting. Let me start from this. He says, how can I explore citizenship by investment outside Nigeria? And then the question is, how much does it cost? <laughs> citizenship by investment? Is it that you are trying to... The person um, wants to elope, if I may. <laughs> so he wants. To, so the same way you say you want to go to school uh, and travel, you yeah. you are asking if there's a way to invest and travel. So I'm guessing. Right? Yeah, invest and disappear, or invest and probably get a different passport that you can use to enter a country at any time you choose. Okay, and uh, what I'll say is, um, this is in our metrics website. Um, there are different. There are some on our metrics that offer citizenship. So just visit the just visit the website and look for the ones, the countries that you want to apply to and see the opportunities that are available there. Uh, but in terms of cost for citizens, so the cost is in terms of how you can get citizenship in other countries. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'll say it can cost as much as you know, it could be 500k, but it should also be as high as five million era. Yeah, so I guess it depends on the country you want to go to. So um, yeah, just read up on specific countries and see. Yeah, uh, just to add up on what the writer said, uh, basically uh, I think uh, the narrative is just like, uh, there are so many options, but uh, if you're looking at Western nations like United States, definitely you need a, a minimum of $500,000 to get at least a green card. You know, these are kind of visas that are offered for, in the, they're trying to encourage uh, uh, what we call the elite investors uh, with the uh, volume of liquidity that we have and uh, um, bring them to their economy. So um, other EU countries or offshore countries offer uh, between 500 and $1 million. That's Malta, uh, Spain, and other uh, offshore countries. But if you look at, you really want to look deep, I think uh, the cheapest options you always get is uh, the uh, the Asian countries, um, Macau, Hong Kong, and um, recently Australia, I think that goes for less. So it all depends, just like what I said, the, there are so many options, but it all really depends on your income, your net uh, value again, and um, your age. Then you also need to put other, other things in consideration, uh, the tax, uh, because in the United States, for example, even though they said you, have, you must have a minimum of $500,000, they would also look at other metrics, like how much are you really earning? Where are the source of such funds? So, if you think your funds are a please don't try that option because there's, they usually do a very deep background check on this type of thing. They won't want to give their citizenship to criminals. So I advise people that have genuine courses to apply. Thank you. If, if you really have such funds, yeah, can apply. <laughs> the, the clause <laughs> there being if. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so this person is also asking another person, uh, not the same person anyway, says, please, could you explain the 2020 petroleum industry bill and okay, I... can it boost the economy? 2020 petroleum industry bill, the PIB that's uh, currently in the House of Assembly, 
And uh, how can it boost the economy? That's what the person is asking. Um, again, just a summary. The petroleum industry bill um, kind of came up as a need to commercialize the petroleum industry. So as we have known, NNPC, we've taken a look at their financial statements in recent time. It's been pretty scary. Um, so they are coming up with um, you know, policies on how they can commercialize the, in the petroleum industry and basically sell off some part of NMPC, I, I believe. So um, just like every other sector that has been commercialized, if you take something off the hands of the um, public sector and then you move into the private sector, you know, private sector guys, you expect that things would be a little more um, efficient. So um, I guess we just have to you know, keep watching for, for that to happen details um, but that's the idea the idea is that um, the private sector would now be in charge and things would become a lot more efficient right uh, okay Olumide, you want to add something to that before we move on to uh, the next you said yeah the whole idea is deregulating the uh the petroleum sector you know don't forget that this is uh, one of the most um, controversial sector in, in the nigeria's economy because um, you'll be so surprised that um, a country that makes um, about 90% of its export earnings from that and about uh, from uh, such um, sector still um, does not really have a lot to show for it in terms of um, this parasitic earnings. You know, for the past couple of years, NMPC has been declaring losses. So a lot of investors are wondering what is really happening, you know, when you have the likes of Exxon Mobil, Chevron, Shell, multinationals generating multi millions of dollars, you know. And if you look at Saudi Aramco recently, gave billions of um, dollars in dividends. So, a lot of investors really uh, are excited that this kind of thing is going as long as as long as it goes through the right channel. You know, the regulating is a very good thing. But uh, once it's sold to cronies and other uh, dark channels, then it becomes a problem. So I think it's going to be like liberate the sector. You're going to reduce bureaucratic processes. You're going to uh, cut down red tapes and uh, dark channels. Like I said, it's going to increase efficiency. Although some uh, critics say that uh, the kind of bill is going to allow. A much more capitalist approach, but I I I think uh, we have gone um, um, we have gone past the era of uh, social uh, capital, uh, social socialism in the oil sector, where uh, government has to intervene almost everything, and we can see that these things are poorly managed. You can imagine our refineries are uh, not up to date, you know, and these are just three refineries serving about 200 million people. So where does this get us to? So I I, I think that um, the PIBO's intention is good. It's just the implementation a lot of us are waiting to see. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you very much. Uh, so there's another question which seems closer to home. Uh, the question is, is there any difference between an IPO and a direct listing? And the person wants to, wants to know um, what the difference is and if you can explain to him or her. So. Okay. I IPO is initial public um, offering, and the idea, when you want to raise funds, you can either go to the public, you know, bring out new shares, sell it to the public on the stock exchange. Everybody buys, you make money. Um, on a di for, for a direct listing, on the other hand, it's pretty much, um, you know, it's not sold. It's it's not sold um, with the way you sell an IPO, when IPO works to the public. It's true that it's true direct investors. Um, existing inf investors, you're not getting, you're not getting new shares. So it's just your standing, your exact astounding shares that you are selling to, um, you are selling to regular, to your investors. So um, think of it this way: the IPO you go through um, an exchange, but direct listing you don't go through an exchange. Mm. Yeah, good question. But let me counter that a bit. Uh, the IPO you said uh, in in design, just like what I said, is just uh, selling new uh, shares to the uh, public, uh, uh, creating new um, shares that are created by uh, investment banks or the writers. So uh, in the IPO era, you have to go through an underwriter or investment bank, and that's where you see many of these stocks uh, like uh, coming out from. But in direct listing, I mean, a lot of a lot of companies are going through direct listing because one. It costs out the investment banks. You don't have, you don't need an underwriter. Just like from the word direct listing, you sell the existing shares directly to the public. But it, it goes through the exchange. So I'll give you an example. Slack, Spotify, recently they went they went through the direct listing option. And the advantage is that if you have publicity, if your brand is really occultic, uh, meaning that you have huge followings, you don't really need an investment bank to do your marketing and and take exorbitant charges from you. 
So it works out for them. But it doesn't work out for people that don't really have a strong brand following. Like I said, you know, that if this thing really, your brand, uh, contr uh, your brand, um, Aurora will really determine how much investors will come in because a company needs, you need to, um, people need to understand what your company is about. So IPO, uh, IPO basically are the traditional ways uh, which companies uh, raise funds and uh, banks don't really like the direct listing option because uh, it cuts them out of business. And don't forget that many investment banks end uh, fortune from this asset. So it's something evolving. And we just recently Coinbase announced they were going through the direct listing option. So it's something that we are seeing that is changing, but we've not seen that really in Nigeria because of the kind of uh, uh, substitution uh, that has not um, gotten to that, uh, uh, the kind of level of substitution, uh, substitution that it entails when you sell direct listing. And usually when you are going through direct listing option, uh, the, the company doesn't want to dilute its uh, uh, share ownership. Yeah. All right, thank you guys. Uh, well, uh, we're about to draw the curtain on the show. Uh, there was one question though that uh, I know this person asked specific, uh, specifically for Ugo. I wanted Ugo Dre to 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 answer it, uh, but I just you guys don't have to answer though. But I just read it out, just maybe for for the sake of reading. It says, "Hello, Ugo. Any idea why the CBN is so involved in everything in Nigeria?" <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. <laughs> because they're the CBN, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so I mean, what do you expect? I think I think this question has a little bit of a sarcasm uh, to it. <laughs> no, but I, I think the listener needs to understand that um, any any regulator that controls the monet monetary pipeline of that nation would definitely have an old. It's just like saying, why does the Federal Reserve uh, Bank in US control the dollar? You know, the the, the, the one of the mandates of the uh, the CPN is to ensure uh, financial stability. Uh, uh, see that uh, banks you know, don't I, have. I, 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 I know. I, I was just, I was just, I was just being cheeky yeah, there. So, okay. <laughs> so, I, yeah. I, I think um, it's it's normal. I don't think there's anything unusual, you know, for any central bank of that country to have such. Who, since um, as far as their mandate is concerned, they control the monetary policy of that nation or that geopolitical uh, uh, area. Thank you. Oh. I would also say um, they have spent so much money, you know, invested so much in stimulus, so they need to recover their investments. So they need to be involved in how the economy is going. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for listening. Remember, this is going to be available at YouTube.com. And just go over there and uh, check out the word Naira metrics. That's the word Naira and metrics spelled together. And you can get to watch the video over and over again. Remember the newsletter for stock, if you wanna get the best in the stock market and just have some pointers to it, go to ssn.nyrometrics.com and you get Nyrometrics stock, stock select newsletter. That's ssn.nyrometrics.com uh, for Ugodre's stock peak. And of course, don't forget to visit the website, www.nyrometrics.com. Thank you guys once again for joining us. And Thank I hope you. to see you guys next week, okay? All right.